Well, glad that you're here. Glad that you're watching us online. I don't know about you, but one of the exhausting things these days is that it seems like every day when we get up, there's something new in the news that is like kind of all-consuming. And, um, and of course, right now we're all concerned about the president and the first lady and his administration, and we'll, we'll take a moment to pray for them all uh, later. But one of the things that happens is that other things that were pretty big in the news cycle kind of get pushed aside. And one of those is, I don't know if we've forgotten about these wildfires they're having out west. I think they're getting a little bit better. But I, like, I look at pictures of that and I cannot imagine living there. It's like, it's like you're living in the apocalypse. I mean, there's fires and scorched earth and everywhere there's just smoke and you can't see anything. And, and um, I can't imagine what it's like to live in that kind of environment. Although I do think that we can kind of imagine a similar kind of environment because everything seems to be the last few months on fire here in our country, wherever we're at. And we kind of live in a in sort of a, a wildfire of our own in terms of the political landscape that we're living in. And, and it's kind of another sort of fire that's burning around. And so we're in the series, A Separation of Church and Hate. And I said last week, what we're trying to do is remind us and I'm trying to remind myself, as I shared last week, about, about how as Christians, we, we have a choice as we kind of as we go through the days and the weeks and, and live through all of the stuff. We have a choice. I'm not talking about a choice of, of who to vote for or not vote for, but we have a choice in how we're going to respond in the midst of this raging fire that has swept through our country, dividing people and and scorching the earth and destroying. And our choices, as I said last week, our choices, first of all, we can have our identity rooted in Jesus Christ. And as Christians, that we can view everything through that lens of, of, of Christianity. Um, or we can view everything through the lens sort of a, of our political identity and, and what we're for and what we're against and, and all of these kinds of things. But our choice to be, first of all, rooted in Christ is really what we're, what we're trying to remember we need to do. And we, we've been looking at, at how to do that and sort of different ramifications of that. Last week, we talked again about how we need to have our identity rooted in, in Christ. We need to, he needs to be the basis of who we think ourselves to be. Next week, we're going to talk about how we need to demonstrate humility. And then the week after that, we need to strive for unity. And then the last week, how we need to be known for charity or love. But today I want to talk about how we need to behave with civility. Because in all honesty, I think this is one of the things that if we, if we as a church, if we as a Christian people don't get this right, I think much danger can come. So we want to, want to talk about how do we behave with civility. And I want you to picture, let's picture that you live out west and say you're maybe going into a building or maybe it's your home and it's engulfed in flames. And as you go into this home, I want you to imagine this. You have in each hand, you have a bucket. And one of the buckets that you have is red, and the other bucket is, is blue. Now here, I'm not talking about, you know, political colors. I'm not talking about blue and red politically. But I'm talking about what's in these buckets, that you have a choice of what you, of what you put on this fire that's raging around you. So in the blue bucket, there's, there's water. There's water. In the red bucket, in your other hand, there's, there's, there's gasoline. And so you have this opportunity that in the, in the midst of this conflagration, you can either douse it with water or you can add to the fire and make it, and make it worse. And so what we're talking about this morning is, is, is how, do we, how do we as Christians, how do we as people, as his people, avoid pouring more gasoline on things when they get heated and, and instead trying to be a calming influence and, and behaving with civility. And so, so we, have, we have that choice of, of wh- which, bucket, which bucket are we going to use. And every day, every day we choose, every day through our attitudes, through our actions, through the things that we say, through the things that we tweet, retweet, post, uh, things that we share, we all, like we make choices and and which of these buckets we're going to be drawing from on that day. And obviously, the, the ways of the red bucket, the, 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 the gasoline on the fire, is not the way of Jesus. I think Jesus did one time, he said, hey, blessed, blessed are those who pour gas on the fire. Like, didn't he say that? Like, that's in the message, right? You know, blessed are the what? 
Peacemakers, right. So, so blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who, who, who act to, to, to de-escalate things. Now, so what is civility? What does it mean to behave with civility? A lot of people think, well, it's just politeness, that we need to be a good person, we need to be okay to live with and be a decent human being, and, and where all that is very true, it's, it's really much more than that. Interestingly, the word um, civility come, literally means good citizen. It means a good citizen. In other words, as a good citizen behaving with civility, you, you learn that you need to play well with people, that you need to share the sandbox, that you need to share the same space with people and realize that the whole world, like it's not about you, it's not about me, it's not about our opinions, that, that there's a lot of other people and, and being civil means that we show respect and regard for other people. And we behave in ways that truly promote the common good. Even if we don't, even if we don't agree with people. And we need to accept that. We need to accept that not everybody is going to agree with us on everything, but we need to learn to disagree with others without being what? Disagreeable. Like I, they didn't get it in the first service either. I'm kind of worried. Like I've, I've said that many, many times. We need to learn to disagree with each other without being disagreeable. Thank you. See how easy that is? Now, now that doesn't mean, like it doesn't mean that we never talk about tough issues. It never means that we never talk about our beliefs or try to, try to defend kind of what we believe and why we believe it. It really doesn't mean all of that. It doesn't mean that we never debate things. It doesn't mean we never stand up for truth when we, when we think we need to or disagree with somebody. But it means how we treat people will, will look a lot more like Jesus did when he disagreed with people, especially when we disagree with people. Doesn't mean being civil, doesn't mean that we have to change our position, but most often it does mean that we have to change our attitude toward those whom we disagree with. Civility, being, being civil is not a personality trait. It's not something that, well, some people just have it and some people don't. Some people are born introverts. Some people are born extroverts. Some people are born, you know, with a red bucket. Some people are born with a blue bucket. It's not a, it's not a personality trait. It's not certainly a, a spiritual gift for people to say that to me. Well, Chris, you know, like, like love and all that stuff. That's just not my gift. Everybody has their own spiritual gift and that's just not my spiritual gift. No, it's not a spiritual gift. It's a, it's actually more, civility is more of a, of a, of a fruit of the spirit. Or rather, it's an aspect of an amalgamation of different, different parts of the fruit of the Spirit, like love and joy and peace and patience. And the fruit of the Spirit isn't something that a Christian either has or doesn't have. The fruit of the Spirit is if you are a born-again believer and you have the Holy Spirit within you, then the Spirit of God should be, should be manifesting this fruit in your life. And if we're Christians walking in Christ with the Holy Spirit, we ought to be exhibiting these things like, like the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, all these things in increasing measure. So it's not like as Christians we can say, well, I, you know, I, I'm just not, that's not me. Like I'm, I'm just not, I'm just not a civil person. Well, the Apostle Paul had a lot to say about this. The Apostle Paul says that in light of who you are, in light of whose name you wear, in light of what you say you believe, there are some implications for how we're to live. And I've, I've said this many times, but one of my favorite uh, books of the Bible is the book of Colossians. Uh, for a lot of reasons. There are a lot of reasons why I love that book. But specifically, how we are to conduct ourselves in kind of a situation when, when we're tempted to act otherwise. When we're tempted really to act other than Christ would have us to act. And it, and it comes in Colossians chapter 3. We're going to be looking at a few verses from there. You can turn uh, in your Bibles uh, if you would like or it's going to be on the screen. But at Colossians 3, so, so the Apostle Paul would, would write things like this. He would say in verse 1, now, now since you have been raised with Christ... Since you've been raised with Christ, set your heart on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, 
not on earthly things. For you died, and I love this phrase, for you died and your life now is hidden with Christ in God. Your life now is hidden with Christ in God. You, you, who, who you are, your kind of your base personality ought to be out of view from people. That you ought to be hidden with Christ. Hidden with Christ in God. Verse 5, uh, put to death therefore whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Another version says to whatever is lurking deep within you. It says impurity, lust, evil desire, greed, things like that. He says we all have, we all have these bad things in us. And our goal as Christians, like all this stuff isn't, like our goal isn't to contain it, isn't to kind of keep it pushed down from, from popping up. Our goal is to, what does he say? He says, put it to death. That is our goal as Christians, to put, put all of this stuff to death and then to let God birth, birth something new in us that will treat people differently. Verse 7, he says, you, you used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. And here's the list. Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Paul said, hey, you, like you used to do a bunch of stuff like that. And if you hear this morning, like, like you used to do a bunch of stuff like that, maybe hopefully more than you do now, like anybody, you used to do some stuff like that, Right? I feel like when I read this, I'm like, Paul, wh- how did you know? Like, you're, you know, how did you know that this would describe me perfectly, he says. But you used to, you used to, you used to walk in the past tense, past tense. He says, but now you must also rid yourselves of all of these things. You used to do stuff like that. But now, now you don't. Now that, you, now that you've tasted the Lord's goodness and grace, there are some actions, there are some attitudes in your life that need to be put to death. And part of this has to do with getting past this, this age of rage. This age of rage. It's time to be done with that. Uh, time to be done with, with slander, he says. You know, like saying whatever you want about somebody. Posting whatever you want. Uh, forwarding, tweeting, whatever it might be. And you don't even know if it's true or not, but it sounds good. It, it's a good zinger. And so you just forward it. And you think, man, that'll, that'll get them. That'll get them. Slander. Dirty language and, and don't lie for you have stripped off your old sinful nature, he says. Scripture says like it's wicked. It's wicked and we're supposed to take it off like an old shirt and then to put on, put on a, something new and look more like our creator. Now, as, as we said last Sunday in, in the, the series we did on the kingdom of God several weeks ago that, that we are representatives of God. The Bible literally says we are his ambassadors. We are representatives of him. We are to make him look good, to represent his interests wherever, wherever we're at. And so, so he writes this in verses 11 through 15. He says here, here, talking about the, in the church, there is now no Jew or Gentile or circumcised or uncircumcised or slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Now understand, he's not talking to their, he's not talking there to us as Americans. He's talking, he's talking to the church. He's talking to us in America who proclaim to be Christians that we, we have a choice which, like which bucket we're going to bring. Which bucket we're going to bring. Verse 12, he says, therefore, as God's chosen people, again here he's talking, he's talking to the church. Holy and dearly beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. And then he says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Man, that is, that's really clear how we're supposed to conduct ourselves. That's really clear how as Christians we are supposed to act. Because here's the, here's the deal. People, people who need God in their lives, and, and everybody who doesn't have God needs God in their lives, but people who are lost, people who need Christ, people who need God, they oftentimes aren't going to be open to it, not because they disagree so much with the claims of Jesus or what the Bible says. In fact, a lot of times people are, they're attracted to Jesus. They're attracted to the things Jesus says. They're attracted to much of what the Bible says and what the, what the Christian faith stands for. But the problem is the thing that oftentimes turns them off. Like it's you and me. It's, it's us Christians. Because sometimes, quite frankly, we, like we just act like jerks. Like there's no, there's no other way to put it. I love a, a pastor out in out west named Eugene Cho. He wrote a great book on the Christians' engagement with politics called "Thou Shalt Not Be a Jerk." 
Like, I, I, love the, I love this book. I love that title, Thou Shalt Not Be a Jerk. I want to read you just a couple things that he says in there. He says, church, disagreeing with someone's politics, views, religion, and ideology is never permission to harass or bully that person. And certainly it's never okay to threaten their well-being. Just don't do it. And don't let people you know do it. In other words, don't be a jerk for Jesus. Though, we've, though we live in an amazing era with electric cars, unlimited information, our fingertips, smartphones, all this technology, our connected world provides such a, an amazing platform for being a jerk. Before the advent of the internet, he said jerks usually needed to be big, physically intimidating bullies or people who weren't hugged enough as a child or people in power who never got the memo about kindness, he said. But today, because of the internet, because of social media, anyone can be a jerk. Even misguided grandmas can be jerks. Even, oh, this is, he's hitting low here. Even, even pastors can be jerks. We just, we just sit there fuming, spewing our opinions, relevant or not. We say things that almost no one in real life would ever say to another person, yet somehow we're okay with it because we're not sitting right across from them. It's in the safety of the internet. I mean, basically, he's saying that we can't treat people like garbage and talk to them like garbage and then expect them to be open to what we have to say about the love of God. I was, I did something that I, I, I hesitate whether or not to tell you this because I'm not really proud of it because I, I say all the time, don't ever do this, but, but I did it. I was, I was on a, a newspaper website that I read frequently and, and there were the comment section. And I, I almost never put comments in sections, you know, and, and I, like, I, I, I shouldn't have done it, but I did it. So this newspaper is largely read by probably non-Christian people. A lot of them are avowed atheists, uh, but there was this one article that was written, and there was this big, long discussion that was based on basically what this guy was saying in his book, how, how Christians are hypocritical, they're jerks, they're horrible, this and that and the other thing. And I, I felt compelled as a pastor and as a Christian uh, to kind of get in that fray. And so I did. And so I said, hey, listen, I'm a, I'm a Christian. I'm a pastor. And, and I had to admit to them, like, a lot, of, a lot of what you put here is true. Like, Christians are not, like, you know, just went through this list of things and the Crusades and all this other stuff. And then I kind of apologized on behalf of all Christians. And, and it turned into really a very civil, kind of civil dialogue between a lot of people of different opinions. And, and I really appreciated that. Um, but but there, I didn't change their mind, I'm sure. But there was one comment I thought was pretty funny. And sad at the same time. Somebody posted this after something I said. Well, I feel about Jesus the same way I feel about the Minnesota Vikings. I like Jesus and I like the Vikes. They're fans, not so much. Like, I mean, that, that really represents what a lot of people, a lot of people think. Um, you know, there's a lot to like about the message of Jesus and what Jesus says. There's, some, there's a stumbling block in there that some people don't like. But in terms of just how we're to treat one another, like... People are drawn to that. It's just so often not demonstrated in, in his followers. So civility is important because it's built on the notion that every single human being, every person, no matter what your political stripe or your income or where you're from or what, every single person is, has innate dignity and worth because they're a person made in the image of God. But we forget this, don't we? And when we're, when we're locked into conflict with somebody, when we're deciding which bucket we want to use, we sort of reduce that person to, to not a person made in the image of God, but to, but to say, here's somebody that disagrees with me. Here's somebody, that, can you believe they believe that? How could anybody think that? How could anybody believe that? Don't they, don't they see what I see? Don't they read? Don't they know? And like we reduce that person to not a person, but, but an it. I like... I like what the great Christian uh, thinker died a couple years ago, Dallas Willard, once said. He said, one of the darkest sins is contempt. One of the darkest sins is contempt. And I, like, I think he's really right with that. When we, when we disdain another person so that we deem them unworthy of civility, we, 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 find, we find somebody contemptible. And what we're really saying is that that person is really less than a person. That, that, that person is, is disgusting. One of the darkest sins is contempt. I don't know um, for sure 
Like maybe she addresses this in her book. I didn't read her book. But, but I bet you anything back in the last election in 2016, if there's one thing that Hillary Clinton would love to do to go back and change if she could, would be when she referred to all supporters of her opponent, Donald Trump, as the deplorables. The deplorables. I don't know if you remember that or not. I don't think that alone cost her the election, but man, it sure cost her a lot of respect. It sure made a lot of the news shows and sound bites, and there was just contempt dripping from her mouth when she said that. And when we allow ourselves to feel this way about any persons or groups, oh, they, they, like, they disgust me. I don't want anything to do with them. It creates this distance. And so talking about Jesus and sharing Jesus and, and how God loves them becomes absolutely impossible. See, the opposite of love isn't just hate. The opposite of love is really contempt. Again, it convinces me that this person isn't really a person. They're just this thing, this mouth that disagrees with me rather than somebody created in the image of God. And so we have, we have in our nation, we have, unfortunately, many times among church people, we have a crisis of contempt. And we need a lot more Christians who are leading the way and demonstrating kindness and civility, even when disagreeing about extremely important, important things. And, and this leads us to be angry. Now, the word, the word civility, like, that's not, that's not really found in and of itself in the Bible as much. But this word anger that incivility leads to is all over the pages of Scripture. One of the reasons a lot of Christians like to pour gas on a fire, because we're convinced that our anger, our outrage, is righteous and holy anger, Right? Like we're, we're just sticking up for God and I'm justified in, in expressing my anger to whoever I want, however I want, whenever I want, because, because I'm right <laughs> and this other person is wrong and, and it's, it's righteous anger. And so too many Christians are unthinkingly unleashing outrage at their, at their own personal offense, at their own political convictions or personal opinions on race or government or global warming or Black Lives Matter, whatever it might be, when, when what they think is they're, they're just, this is righteous anger. No, they're, they're angry because somebody is disagreeing with them and, and they don't know how that person cannot see, cannot see what's true, right? And so we, so we, we burn all these bridges. I love what what pastor in Atlanta, Georgia, Andy Stanley says, please never ever burn a relational bridge over a political view. Like, is that, has that ever happened to you? Like, don't ever burn a relational bridge over a political view. It's, it, like, it's just not worth it. And it's downright unchristian. And yet it happens all the time. It happens all the time because this goes to our identity. What is, again, what is our basic identity? Are we primarily a Christian, somebody who sees everything through Christian lenses, or are we primarily something else? Are we primarily about defending our tribe or, or our cause or, or whatever it might be, or are we primarily going to be identified as Christians? Now understand that there is an anger of God. There is a such thing as a righteous anger of God. And, and, and in the Bible, we see this when people are, are treated inhumanely and all kinds of things that God, God does not like that. But let's face it, most of the time, our, our outrage, our disgust, our whatever it might be, is, is really not because of that. Uh, Ed Stetzer, a pastor and author, writes, If your anger is not tempered by that steadfast love and compassion and mercy and forgiveness of God, then it's not like God, and it's not righteous anger. It's not righteous anger. Jesus' own brother, James, says this in the little book that he wrote in James chapter 1, uh, verse 19. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone ought to be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry because anger doesn't produce the righteousness God desires. In other words, anger does not produce in us or develop within us the fruit of the spirit. And so we need to not be, not be anger. Righteous anger is aimed at the glory of God, but human outrage is aimed at just defending ourselves or our, op or our opinions or our tribe or our point of view or whatever it might be. And it really doesn't help anything. And especially it doesn't help the cause of Christ. Now, again, not that, not that we can't have opinions, not that we can't discuss them, not that we can't debate even, even you know, with, with great effort, not that we can't do that thing, but when it comes down to it, how are we, how are we treating people? 
See, how, how we believe, what we believe, and whom we believe really needs to be evident in how we treat people. And, uh, and, and, and Jesus said, you know, when you, it's like, it's not like the Ten Commandments says, hey, thou shalt not murder. And he's like, yeah, that, that's a good one, but I'm going to go a step further that when, when you feel anger and rage and disgust towards somebody in your heart, that's like, that's, that's worse, he said. And so he puts things like anger and contempt on the same continuum as murder. He says, when you call somebody a fool, when you, when you call somebody an idiot, <laughs> have you ever done that? <laughs> right? Like you're, you're in danger of the fires of hell, he says. And so in these moments, we're forgetting who we are and we're not acting like who we are. I, I love, this is why I think Paul said this in Philippians. Check this out in Philippians chapter 4. There's this little part of a verse, a verse that we don't really pay attention to because it's in the, in the context of a verse that we all love about not to be anxious and all that. But he says, let your gentleness be evident to all for the Lord is near. Let your gentleness be evident to all for the Lord is near. Now, I read that verse, and I'm like, what does that mean, the Lord is near? Well, there are two schools of thought. One, one group says, well, what Paul meant was the Lord is near in terms of he's going to come, the second coming. It's second coming language that, that the Lord is near. He's going to come at any moment, like he said many times he would. Then there's another school of thought that says, no, what he really means there is that the Lord is near in the sense that He's, he's everywhere. Like he can see what you do. He, he knows what you think. He's near. So, so let your gentleness be evident to all because the Lord is near. And I'm like, well, 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 which one is it? Is he talking about second coming or is he talking about because Jesus sees everything that we do and think and say? And my answer is yes. Like, like I think it's both, right? Because we're told often in the New Testament, Jesus himself said, I'm going to come when, when, when nobody's expecting it. So just, just be ready. And if by being ready, he doesn't mean how we treat people and talk to people. I don't know what in the world he's, what he's talking about. But he sees everything. He hears everything. And the big danger of social media, especially, I'm going to pick on social media here for a little bit. It's so easy, so easy to, to, to post something and fire off a shot or, or retweet something or forward a video or whatever it is, rather than actually seeing, first of all, if it's true and Easier than looking at somebody and discussing it. Now, I, I, um, I preached a series a few, I don't know, seems like a thousand years ago, but a few months ago, maybe on screen time, and I talked about social media and computers and smartphones and all this stuff. But if you have not yet seen it, there is a, a, a documentary on Netflix. And if you don't get Netflix, first of all, good for you, but you need to subscribe to it, if only for a month, to be able to watch this documentary called The Social Dilemma. And it's, it's called The Social Dilemma, and it's, it's, about, it's about how social media manipulates us and, and, and to doing what we want it to do, all, of course, for, for profit, for cash. And it's absolutely, like, I, I knew all that stuff, but, but to hear people who actually designed social media, to hear them talk about what they designed this to do to us, it's, it, it, it's a mess. Social media is an absolute mess. And so at the very least, think before you post, put, put, put your, your Jesus glasses on before you respond, before you fire off a tweet, before you, before you forward some kind of nonsense that you don't know is true, but it, it supports whatever you want to, want to believe. Just be very careful about, about it. Um, think before you post. The golden rule applies even to even to the interweb, like it just does. Frederick Buechner, I love what he, what he wrote one time. The great author said, although kindness is not the same thing as holiness, it's awfully close. Even though kindness isn't the same thing as holiness, it's awfully, awfully close. So let's act, act with civility. Act with civility, even when we vehemently disagree with somebody. A couple of years ago, comedian Sarah Silverman uh, was the victim of an awful, vicious, vicious, brutal attack on Twitter. This guy on Twitter called her an absolutely horrible name. Like, it's just a, a very, very horrible name. And it would have been so easy for Sarah Silverman, especially with her gift for words and, and, and sarcasm, to just, I mean, she could have incinerated that dude on Twitter. I mean, she could have just laid him out. It would have been so easy for her to do that because we know, like, it is so easy just to fire something back 
When somebody says something that we don't like, we could, she could have brought just like a, a, a red bucket of fire and open up a can of other stuff. I mean, like all over this guy, but, but that's not what she did. In fact, and as a matter of fact, she, she responded with this amazing, astonishing grace and compassion and gentleness. And she asked the man, and this is a Twitter conversation. She asked him, why, why did you, sir, why did you lash out at me like that? And she went on to ask him, like, are, are you okay? Is, is there something going on in your life that, that would cause you to, to put something like that? And after they went back and forth a couple of times, this man actually opened up about some pain that he was going through. And then they went back and forth and they actually built this bridge. And, and, and she had an amazing conversation, a redemptive conversation with this guy on Twitter in front of all of her followers on Twitter, thousands of people. And she told the man, she said, hey, listen, I know that times are rough for you. I know things are hard, but you can, like, I believe in you. You can get through this. And she encouraged him to, to, get, some, to get some help, to get some therapy. And then she and some of her followers on Twitter actually paid for this guy funded his therapy. I mean, when faced with such kindness and unexpected grace, the man apologized. He said, yeah, I, 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 you're right. I, I need to go for help and I'm going to go for help. And then he wrote on there, I am really thankful for Sarah Silverman. I mean, that's, that's pretty radical. Wouldn't you agree? So much cooler than getting the last word and bashing him and outdoing him in a verbal, in a verbal fisticuffs. So countercultural what she did. So it's kind of so Christian what she did. Now, she's not a Christian. I've never really read her books or watched her shows or whatever. Ethnically, I'm pretty sure she's Jewish. But what she did in that instance, it looks a lot like Jesus. It looks a lot more like Jesus than some of the things I've seen on social media from, from some followers of Jesus, including myself. Now listen, people who have the identity that Jesus gives to us, those of us that identify as Jesus followers, as his kids, like we need to look like him because we're his ambassadors. We are, we are the citizens of heaven and that is really what matters. That's what matters, matters the most. So I want to go back Kind of to wrap up here with some more words from one of my new favorite books, Eugene Cho's Thou Shalt Not Be a Jerk. Don't you think that's hysterical? Like, no? I don't know. Maybe just, maybe hit me as funny because I'm a warped pastor and a lot of it actually was addressed to pastors. But um, I think it's really great the way he ends the book. This is what he says. He says, amid the craziness of our world, past, present, and future, we believe in a Savior who entered human creation as a baby, grew up to be the ultimate teacher and ultimate sacrifice. And that doesn't change. doesn't change when the other party wins. That doesn't change when the legislation that you're advocating doesn't go through. Everyone take a breath. Breathe in. Breathe out. Political leaders come and political leaders go. But through every election, through every year, through every century, through every millennium, Jesus Christ remains king. Earthly kings, presidents, congressmen, senators are going to come and go. But Jesus is the eternal king. No matter who is in power, our lives are in his hands. This doesn't guarantee bliss and perfection. We will all certainly face challenges and difficulties, but our lives still remain in his hands. And we have to remind ourselves and others that Jesus ultimately defeated sin and death. And we can declare to all who have ears to hear the good news that through Jesus Christ, a new world is breaking forth amid the brokenness. And when we truly believe this, when we truly believe this, there's, there's no need to be a jerk. Jesus will always remain on his throne forever, for eternity. Amen and amen. Amen. 